I've known, I guess I've known you since you were a grad student, probably, or just yeah, about. Right. Um, and he's, oh, I didn't, didn't record, you grad student at Harvard, postdoc, IAS. IAS, and then straight to Santa Cruz from there, yes, a very distinguished career. Um, he's, he's known, I know for his work on um, sort of very deep questions in cosmology, he's worked on tunneling, worked on arrow of time, and a lot of topics um, that I'm also interested in, I've learned a lot from him over the years. And he's also known for work in um, star formation, and, and um, do you continue that? I, I'm so out of touch with that field, but you do continue yeah. that, so, so I know. And that's a, so anyway, we're lucky to have him so close by, and, and um, it's always a lot of fun. Talking. He's also actually one of the originators, I guess you're a, a co-leader of FQXI, right. which is a very um, very interesting force in terms of supporting um, very adventurous physics. It's not always that easy to find through traditional sources. So. Uh, we, we are very, very fortunate to have Anthony here and look forward to learning about closed systems and black holes. Thanks, Paul. We'll, we'll see how fortunate you are <laughs> as time goes on. Um, so, uh, as Andy said, I, I spend most of my time thinking about cosmology. Um, but over the years, I've been very frustrated by you know reading about cosmological horizons and black hole horizons and black holes. and. And I've gone back and forth between trying to understand whether I just didn't understand everything and everybody else pretty much did, or whether nobody understood it. And I've sort of gone back and forth, and I'm still not quite sure, but I'm currently in a phase of thinking that nobody really understands it. Um, and so it's worth spending some time trying to understand at least uh, a picture that makes sense to me. So this is a bit of a work in progress, as I said, and the perspective that I'm coming from is one that did originate in cosmology which is um, when we talk about physics you know, in, in undergraduate stat mech, we talk about closed systems. Like let's imagine that we just have this system, it's got some evolution operator, it's got some set of states, and nothing outside affects it. And we always know that that's just a convenient fiction, um, and that realistically we're making some approximation or we're trimming out all kinds of other things that in principle could affect it, uh, but we're just assuming that they're, they're not important. But, in relativity, you can have a genuinely closed system that is a system that, due to causality, nothing can actually affect what happens inside. So one example that I'll talk about extensively is, say, this uh, region of space-time here. If I want to know, if I specify some data, as I'll describe in detail here, I can describe everything in the system without anything outside of the diamond uh, affecting it. And people have thought, have been thinking a lot recently about the so-called causal diamond and causal patch, partly for this reason. Another is uh, if I have the whole universe, so this is a, a picture of like a spatially closed universe, then there's no outside and, and you sort of have automatically a closed system. Um, and you, we can argue whether an infinite universe is also a closed system or more of an open one, but uh, this one's more or less clear. An open system is one that has a time-like boundary um, and stuff can just free, stuff and information can just freely govern it. So, if we want to think about a closed system in relativity, there's a whole actual apparatus sitting around for it that, that we've known about for a long time, which is to say, let's take some, some surface, an achronal surface where you know, no two points are in causal contact. Um, it can have an edge or it can run off to infinity uh, for these purposes. Uh, I'll call that surface S0. And the so-called domain of dependence of that surface, uh, if, you have, if you're not haven't looked at your relativity definitions lately, is the set of all points with the following property. You're in the future domain of dependence of S0 if you take a point, and if every past-directed causal curve runs into S0, then you're in the domain of dependence. So that is, if I, if I start here and I take, you know, trace all the different paths I can go back as long as the, none of them are space-like, uh, they all must run into S0. And so the idea is that if I have data on, say, this portion of S0, and I want to know about this point, I've, got, I've kind of covered the past lifetime of that point. So I can't need to know anything else other than that data. I can't have to know anything out here or out here to tell what's happening at that point. So if I compute the, the future domain of dependence of S0, I'll get this region here and the past domain of dependence, this one. So this is the region that I can 
predict using data on S, suitable data on SEER and the region that I can retrodict using suitable data on SEER. So this is a closed system. Uh, well, let, I'll say that in a minute. Now, there's, there can be a limit to how much you can predict given your data on S0. If it doesn't, <coughs> if, you know, if you haven't covered the whole space, if the domain of dependence is not the whole space time, then you have a so-called Cauchy horizon. Um, this is sort of the Cauchy problem that you're solving, and the horizon is the edge to what you can predict from the central data. Now, something I, I learned during the course of the project that I didn't know before is that uh, there's a nice way that you can show that you can foliate um, any domain of dependence into a set of equal time surfaces, I'll label them with F, such that this uh, region is the domain of dependence of all of those surfaces. So that is, given data on one of these surfaces, you can evolve it forward or backward in time F to give you any one of the other surfaces. So that's a, a really closed system in the sense that once you know any the system at any time, you know it at every other time. This is all assuming you have some you know, unitary evolution operator, some uh, hyperbolic differential equation or something that, that evolves forward and backward in time. Uh, so that, that's certainly an assumption that's being made. But if you have that, the structure of this is that once you know the data at one time, you know it at all the other times. So all the times are sort of interchangeable in that sense. Um, and the construction is kind of pleasing and simple. What you do is you take a point, say x, you draw the future light cone and past light cone of that point uh, where they intersect your domain of dependence. And then you need some volume measure, I'll call it, uh, well, there should be a dv in here, dv4. So actually this equation is totally scrambled. So this i plus or minus should be down here and there should be a dv4 here. So what, so what this is supposed to be saying is pick a point, look at the future light cone of that point, and pick a volume measure so that that all of those, all the volumes you might compute, like the whole volume of this is finite. So if, if this is a really infinite space, you might have to do a transformation to, get, to pick a, a volume measure that you can integrate over. But it doesn't really matter what the volume measure is. So compute the volume of the future light cone and call that F plus. Compute the volume of the past light cone and call that F minus. Remember truncating at the edge of this thing, if there aren't any. Form the ratio f minus over f plus, so that's something that goes from zero here to infinity here. So if you're on this line, f minus is zero, so it's zero. If you're on this line, f plus is zero, so it's infinity. So this is a time variable from zero to infinity and foliates a space into uh, surfaces like this. These are just hand drawn. Uh, but for each one of them, the domain of dependence is this whole thing. So that's a way that you can, uh, in relativity, define a closed system like this. You, you don't have to know anything else to know how things evolve. Yeah. So it's interesting. That, so you don't expect the system to particularly have recurrences, to, uh, um, even though it's closed. So th I think this would tend to have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, which makes it, I mean, unless, unless it so happens that the system is nice, and because of these surfaces, some, you tend to have time to be Yeah. And, and also, this, this generally, so the one that I've shown here is likely to just be a, a finite duration. right? So there, there's no guarantee that the proper time along here is going to be infinite. Right. It'll generally be finite. Um, and so then, then you don't have to worry so about it. So this infinite time is not necessarily the natural one for the rest of this question. Yeah, so I think, well, it, it may be the case that if there's one with an infinite proper time, there may be some conditions under which you could show that, you know, uh, you'll get to something that, that looks time independent, and then you can think about appearances, and that's, you know, connected with our whole conversation this morning about uh, no hair. Now, something else that's, that's useful in black hole physics to talk about is the so-called stretched horizon. And this is a, rather than null surface, so, so the Cauchy horizon is a null surface. But it's convenient to talk about a time-like <coughs> surface that's just inside or outside the Cauchy horizon. Um, and I'm going to call that the stretched Cauchy horizon. 
So in black holes, you have a stretched horizon, which is sort of a Schwarzschild radius plus epsilon or plus a Planck length or something. Um, we can do the same thing here, defining it to be a fixed physical distance um, along one of these curves, S of F, or one of these surfaces, sorry, S of S, um, a distance epsilon away from the edge, if there's an edge. So this is something that's defined whenever there's a Cauchy horizon like this, not, you know, if the, if the edge is off at infinity or something. Question? Yeah. How much does this depend on the choice of volume measure that you use to, to find that foliation? Yeah, a lot in the sense that, well, every every volume measure will give you its own foliation, yeah. right? So you, so in that sense, it's a matter of, it's like a coordinate system. It's a matter of convenience. I don't think anything is going to go necessarily inconsistent with just defining, I mean, you could maybe make your stretch Cauchy horizon look a little weird if you, with the, with the strange enough volume measure. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it might lose its utility if you picked a funny enough volume measure that there turned out to be like lots of four volume near the edge or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it could be. But it, so so yes, certainly it depends on the foliation depends on the measure. Um, any measure will give you a foliation that does these things, but it. <laughs> it's, I'm not sure how to define a, a Cauchy horizon without using that foliation well. So, um, a couple of sort of the simplest examples that I could, or the simplest test things that I could come up with to try to tackle, which nonetheless end up being hard, is uh, thinking about a, a finite region of Minkowski space. Um, so, for example, if I just take a ball of, of radius r in Minkowski space. So this is the conformal diagram from Minkowski space, the, the one out here. And then I pick a, a ball of radius r inside it, and I just ask about the domain of dependence of that ball. So that's this region here. So S0 is some space-like surface with that radius. I probably should have made it straight, so it's a time 0 in Minkowski space. This region you can can cover with a fairly convenient coordinate system, as it turns out, although it took a little doing to figure out what that coordinate system was. I'm not going to use it, so I just buried it down here in the corner. Um, but the important thing is that surfaces of constant lambda are these vertical lines here, and surfaces of constant omega are the space-like ones. Omega runs from minus infinity to infinity, and lambda runs from zero to pi over two. Um, and in this construction, the stretched Cauchy horizon is just a surface of constant lambda um, which is epsilon away from pi over 2. <coughs> um, another interesting system you can look at is what I call the Minkowski hole, which is take your initial surface to be all of Minkowski space except for the origin. Just take out that one geometrical point. That means you can't predict formally the stuff up here or down here. What's left in the domain of dependence is the region out here. So it's kind of this uh, the Cauchy horizon expands at the speed of light from the origin uh, and goes out to, to infinity. Um, and this you can conveniently coordinatize with basically just this, the Rindler coordinates, except now they refer to radius and time rather than uh, x and t, which are, which are the, the Cartesian x and t with the, with the Rindler coordinates. Uh, so these are two example systems that, that you can look at, and I've been... Uh, trying to study these um, systems. I'm not going to say, so, so the, the next part is going to be the least defined and most hand wavy part of the talk, so please forgive me, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, anybody's thoughts about this afterwards. Uh, this is the please help me section of the talk. Um, so if I have one of these closed systems, I can talk about, and I, and I have a unitary operator evolving the state uh, through it, I can ask about entropy. So if I if I start out with a pure state um, or some very well defined distribution function, like a delta function distribution function in, in classical physics, um, I'd start I'd have zero entropy uh, initially and always. If I start out with a mixed state um, or some more you know spread out distribution function, I'd have non-zero entropy, but it would still be 
conserved by the unitary evolution operator. Um, <coughs> so, so I can start out with, so that's kind of boring. Now I'm not talking yet about any kind of coarse graining, so of course if I, if I pick some sort of macro states and coarse grain into those macro states, I can do the usual things thinking about entropy and its increase and so on. But I want to stick to the kind of uh, fundamental description in terms of the density matrix or the, or the wave function or the distribution function. Um, now, these systems, interesting things happen when we actually, when you look at their dynamics um, in the closed system coordinates. So, for example, this one, you know, if you're just sitting at the origin, you just sit here. If, if you have a particle that is, well, maybe I made a plot of this, let's see if I did. Um, I'll get to it next. No, maybe I'll skip to it so you can see it here. So if I have an, a particle that's just sitting around following a, a constant position geodesic in the Minkowski coordinates, it follows a world line like one of these black ones. Um, if I'm, if I'm looking at things from the standpoint of this closed system, that is, if I kind of describe things as, as seen by fictitious observers at rest in these closed system coordinates, what they see is that, um, from their point of view, these particles get forced apart, so they, they go farther and farther apart in these, you know, far larger and larger delta lambda between the particles. Um, they get more and more boosted with respect to the observers at rest as <coughs> a constant lambda. Um, so these observers see the, the normal Minkowski geodesic particles get shoved away and eventually just plastered up on this Cauchy horizon H. So every particle other than the one at the origin eventually ends up sort of flowing up to the horizon H. They never actually leave in this closed system description. As omega goes to infinity, they just pile up on the horizon. Of course, from the wider perspective of the Minkowski coordinates, we can see that they zoom right through. There's nothing stopping them. But in this coordinate description, they look like they're getting plastered to the horizon. So the, the sort of logic of this is that once you make the system closed in this causal way, you, you have the capability to coordinate, coordinate just that closed system, which leads to these various perspectives. Right. On, on, on. right, and it's not, it, sometimes it will and sometimes it won't be the sort of most natural perspective to right. look at it, but the, the point is that it's concocted so that you have control over sort of <coughs> everything in the system, and you know that there's no extra ingredients that you're not, and, and this is an especially important in questions of losing or gaining information and so on. Um, now, this, what I just described looks just like a black hole or a de Sitter space, that is, particles, geodesic particles falling into a black hole just get plastered on the horizon. And from the exterior description, which is a closed system outside the, the Schwarzschild horizon, it looks like they, you know, they never quite get there. They just get asymptotically close to the horizon. Same thing in de Sitter space. Things that are, you know, particles that you just let go in de Sitter space will, from the description of the static coordinates inside, will just get plastered up on the horizon, you, you, was, you, know, you think that physically if you were one of those particles you'd leave, but that's in a different description. So in the closed description, uh, they just get stuck on the horizon. Now, if you are in this, so if you're describing a system in this way, um, and all these particles and fields and stuff are sort of piling up on the horizon, that gets very, very hard to uh, deal with, you know, because they're all uh, they're all sort of going away at null speed with respect to you. They're uh, they're stuck, you know, arbitrarily close to the horizon. Um, in some systems, they'll be arbitrarily highly redshifted, you know, in terms of photons getting to you from them. So uh, even though we didn't have any, or we just had, we may have had zero entropy to begin with, or just the entropy due to a uh, the fact that we have a mixed state inside. We can now talk about entropy associated with the horizon, this time the Cauchy horizon, by saying, okay, well, if we take this closed system picture seriously, um, there are these degrees of freedom between the stretched Cauchy horizon R and the Cauchy horizon H that we can't really access. 
Um, they're, they're, they're out of our control at this point. So let's trace over them and get an effective description of what's happening physically inside of R. And so we can then ascribe a, a horizon entropy to the closed system given by tracing over those degrees of freedom. Um, and if we had a pure state, that would also be the entropy of the horizon, that is the entropy of that little region between the stretched <coughs> Now, it's very hard to do calculations that actually do that. Um, there are some in the literature, not so much in curved space-time. Well, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to hear of other people who know more about what's been done in the literature. But what I've found is essentially in flat space and very toy models um, that show that when you do these sorts of calculations where you trace over the degrees of freedom um, in, say, a, a, a free field in, uh, in the Minkowski vacuum or some lattice of oscillators or some, something tractable, what they generally find is that the entropy scales like the horizon area, that is the, the boundary, the area of the boundary that you've traced over the inside or outside of, uh, <coughs> divided by some UV cutoff. That would be the grid spacing if you had a, a lattice model, or it would be some cutoff that you have to impose if you're doing field theory. Now this is very interesting, of course, because um, we know that there is a, we, we already accord an, a, a entropy to horizons, um, which is the area divided by the four times the Planck length square, the area divided by the Planck area over four. Um, so this is, looks awfully similar, this horizon area over a UV cutoff. If you make this like two Planck lengths, then you, then you get just the right answer. But that's just for one field. And so there's a, you know, there's A, a question of is this really all of the entropy, you know, <coughs> If we did this for all the fields in the theory and we did it for gravity, could, could we somehow make an argument that they all work and they all add up to the right uh, horizon entropy that everybody knows and loves in terms of black holes and, and so on? Uh, maybe, and there are arguments in the literature a little bit about that, but I think that's a very open question. But there's at least, there's something here that, that sort of is at least reminiscent of the horizon entropy that you normally describe to horizons. And here it's, you know, again, there's two sources of entropy. One is if you start out in a mixed state, and the second is uh, if you get an effective description by tracing over the stuff that's right near the horizon. And the interplay between those two is an interesting thing that I, I don't fully understand. Uh, in the same sense that you have horizons, you'll have fluctuations, um, at least if you disregard certain recent papers. Um, <laughs> um, so there would be a mixed state if it wasn't if there wasn't one before after you do this tracing over the, the that horizon region. And you'll have fluctuations and, and radiation um, just like in static space times with horizons, except that you can't calculate what it is very easily. And I suppose you uh, maybe you said it and I missed it but you could choose a pure state, mm -hmm. at least at any slice. Yeah. In any region. I think, but yeah. But then it would be, you probably get the down, and the local field theory up or down, you get mixed. I, well, I think, you, I think you can pick a pure state. I think, um, <coughs> although I haven't shown this explicitly, but I, I suspect it's the case that if you pick, say, a, a pure state here and try to evolve it, that you'll you'll get divergences here in, in like the energy momentum tensor on the horizons. Because uh, this is just what happens in the in the black hole case. If you if you don't pick the Hartle Hawking state, you get divergences on the horizon either in the past uh, well on the actual horizon, but the event horizon. Uh, if you pick the the Bolwar vacuum or, or uh, the Unruh vacuum I guess in between the divergences. So just just a comment I mean uh, a, a student here at Davis and I, Josh Cooperman and I, I showed that it, you do get a quarter <coughs> of area of Planck units for any quantum field theory. Not for uh, demonstration doesn't work for gravity. It may be true for gravity fluctuations, but for any quantum field theory, an arbitrary background for the UV sensitive pieces, you get exactly a quarter times the UV the, the quadratic uh, contribution. Oh, cool. to the, so there's a four there too. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Can, can I ask you for that reference after? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, that's very nice. 
Um, so, so when I said that that was going to be the vaguest slide before I lied, because maybe it's this one. And then it will get more precise after this. Um, the, so if I, to think about what the entropy is doing, um, if I took the Minkowski ball um, and put a lattice on it, so this is a calculation that's actually been done, although they didn't call it Minkowski space because it was just space. These were condensed matter people. And maybe the calculations you have are better for this. Uh, so you can, you can show basically that if you start with a pure state and some UV cutoff, and, which is the lattice spacing, and some IR cutoff, which is kind of the size of your lattice, um, you can get the same uh, area over lattice spacing squared. Now, if we, if we look at that for this Minkowski ball, um, then we could start out with some lattice. If you put this Cauchy horizon, <laughs> sorry, the stretch horizon close enough to the Cauchy horizon, you could have basically zero lattices inside it. And you could argue that you know, everything is inside the system at t equals zero and it's a pure state. Now, as time goes by, those lattice sites all evolve steadily onto the horizon. Um, so at the very latest times, basically, all the lattice sites are, um, um, are now horizon degrees of freedom. And you could argue that now, again, it's a pure state. That, you know, there's nothing to trace over um, and no entropy. But in between, you're going to have some sites on one side and one side, and some sites on the other side of this stretched horizon. And you're going to have entropy, which in some regimes will presumably go as the area over uh, length squared. Not all, because I think you know there, uh, you have to have you know. I think at late times it's going to scale like this. At early times it may not, because in these calculations, the when the IR cutoff is important, you're not going to get quite area over length squared. So it looks in this sense like in this system that it starts out with zero entropy, it gets some entropy for a while, and then entropy goes away, um, in the sense that the this this cutoff effectively goes from you know, dividing the system into all interior to half interior to half exterior, half exterior, and then all exterior. This, of course, doesn't mean that entropy is like thermodynamic entropy is decreasing or something like that, but just that the, the way that the, the system is being divvied up, that it looks like entropy is, is going on. Um, you can do something similar in field theory, though, again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, worried that, that the field theory observables will go infinite on this uh, costume horizon. You can do something very similar. Uh, you can do something to the Minkowski hole that turns out very similar to Rindler space. Almost all the computations for Rindler space go through uh, for this Minkowski hole, and so that might be an interesting thing to look at. So, sorry this is somewhat vague again, but I think the, the bottom line is I think there's an interesting approach to thinking about entropy of horizons, which is not, you know, the, normally thing, the normal thing you do if you think about uh, tracing over stuff in general is to trace over all the stuff that's outside the horizon. Right? This is saying a little bit something different, which is you might have to do that in order to pick the state of your system. Uh, but, the, but once you've done that, the only way to get sort of entropy in this thing that wasn't there before is to coarse grain a little bit or, or to, to find an effective description by, by uh, tracing over these degrees of freedom that you've lost control of because they're faster to the horizon. And that, that sort of makes sense to me intuitively, and it would and be an interesting project to try to you know, see where the mathematics goes on, which, which I haven't really done really. Now, though, I want to start talking about black holes with all this stuff kind of in mind. Um, so the black hole conformal diagram, you're surely familiar with the Schwarzschild eternal version. Horizons are here. Um, singularity is here, and infinity is here. Now, there's also this conformal diagram sitting around in textbooks and stuff for an evaporating black hole. Um, it looks kind of like this. You have a black hole that forms by some process here. It's a, it's a shell of radiation or, or null dust or something that comes in. You've got a singularity here, and then you glue onto it what looks like Minkowski space at the top, um, and you say, voila, 
the conformal diagram for an evaporating black hole. And this diagram has driven me nuts for a long time because it just, it just is not right. And it, it is not a good way, I think, to look at an evaporating black hole. So a lot of the impetus of, of the thing that I've been working on most recently is to try to come up with a better description of what an evaporating black hole should look like in terms of the space-time diagram. You know, a couple things you can see that are, that are frustrating about this diagram. It has information loss kind of built in, in the sense that if you take all the data on this slice S3, um, it's kind of obvious that you're not going to get, uh, know anything about this region here. So you can evolve this data backwards, and you're not going to get anything past, so you're not going to know anything that happens inside. Um, for a similar reason, it, uh, another way to say that, I guess, is to say that this whole space is not globally hyperbolic. Um, that is, it's not the domain of dependence of some initial Cauchy surface. So, so people, so if you think that information is preserved in a black hole, you better not draw the diagram like this or you're going to get very confused. If you believe that it's lost, then, then maybe this is a little bit more okay. But if you believe it's preserved, drawing it like this will get you very confused because you, you'll think, oh, look here, I'll draw a Cauchy surface, now I'll evolve up. Now it looks like these points up here are in the domain of dependence of this surface, right, because you tra trace back and you don't go anywhere else. But that's not quite true. Um, this point really should be considered a naked singularity, and the points up here, you know, their world lines going back can end up there, and so this really should not be considered part of the domain of dependence of this surface, S1. And there's a th another, if you don't believe that it should be treated that way, there's a theorem that goes back to Garak in 1970, I think, that, that function that I defined, f, um, that gave the foliation, that f for a hyperbolic space time, globally hyperbolic space time, has to be continuous. But it's not in this diagram. Because if I take f here, it's, it's computing f plus from this light cone, and f minus from this one. As I cross the horizon, suddenly f plus has this contribution from up here, and f minus is the same. So f, that ratio, is uh, discontinuous as you cross the horizon. Um, so that's just another indication that this is not a globally hyperbolic space-time, and which you know everybody I think knows, but people still then draw this diagram when they're talking about evaporating black holes, even when they believe in <coughs> information preservation. So, um, in an effort to do this, I, I I try to think of can we build up an evaporating black hole using pieces of black hole knowledge that we have on hand already. Um, so the idea was, first of all, let's make the black hole in a very simple way by just taking an incoming shell of, of null dust or, or radiation or something. So we can join a Minkowski space here, an incoming shell of stuff, and then after that shell comes in, you've then got the Schwarzschild metric on the other side. So that's just true by Birkhoff's thing. Um, a little bit more of a cheat, but I think there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, is to get rid of the black hole by having another shell of radiation come in with negative energy. So negative energy is kind of bad and so on, but I think here it's not doing any harm, it's just getting rid of the black hole and ending it back up with the casting space. <coughs> that amount of negative energy is not something you normally want to contemplate, but for making this component diagram. Now the trickier part that's more of an assumption is to say, what we really want is that, you know, we know we're not going to be able to just draw a conformal diagram for an actual black hole that has quantum gravity regime and a, sing, you know, a singularity maybe that gets smoothed out by quantum gravity and evaporation and so on. But let's make an assumption that, that the regular space-time description is good up to some threshold amount of curvature. Uh, so that can't be Ricci curvature because that's zero in the black hole, but if you take the, the Kretschmann scalar, that's the r mu nu alpha beta, r mu nu alpha beta. Um, that goes as 1 over r to the sixth. Um, and so a working assumption that I made here uh, is let's just suppose that the quantum gravity regime kicks in at a fixed value of that scale, of that curvature scale. Now in fact it could be a fu any function of, of r and it wouldn't make much difference for what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be that scale of curvature. And since this is Schwarzschild space time, it makes sense that something that only something that's a function of R, since it's spherically symmetric and static, 
could be the cutoff. So if you believe that the space-time is good up to some sort of space-time edge, where then it starts to get foggier and foggier, then I think in Schwarzschild space-time you have to have something that depends on R and it's going to come out something like this. So what I've done uh, in order to, to construct a conformal diagram is say, let's pick some value of the scalar, and let's assume that we're just going to join um, using some you know, shell of, of energy density, the Schwarzschild space-time on the outside, to something on the inside. And, and the something you, I've picked is the sitter space, but you don't have to. Um, it's just a nice uh, eternal vacuum space-time that you can stick in the middle. And other people have done something along the same lines. Hayward has a, has a nice paper. Um, I think it was 2000, I can't remember the, the, the year. Sean Hayward did something sort of similar where they basically interpolated between Schwarzschild on the outside and Desider on the inside uh, with kind of similar results, but I think a little bit less well-defined. So that's assumption two, that I'm going to treat quantum gravity as sort of kicking in at some particular scale. Okay, now that, oh, I should also explain these. So if you draw these diagrams, you know, you can match these up so that the same radius shell here, the same uh, surface, two surface of constant R here matches up with that one, but they won't necessarily you know, match up with the same scale. So you really have to kind of stretch them and everything to get them to match up. So what I've done here is just uh, show that you know, this, is the, this diagram is good while you're in it, this diagram is good while you're in it, this is the surface they're matched across, um, but you shouldn't necessarily glue those on to each other. Nonetheless, I'm going to next just move them onto each other for illustrative purposes. Um, but keep in mind that there really should kind of be this space in between because they're not really the same conformal diagram. Now, one of the, the second maddening thing about that classic um, evaporating black hole diagram is that it has the process of forming a black hole, which might take you know, a time of order m, m is the black hole mass, and, and we're working in units where, where math, time is in units of mass. Um, then it's got evaporation, which takes a really, really long time. Um, and then it's got kind of infinity up here. Now, you can't really have two very different time scales like that on a conformal diagram, the time scale m and the time scale of black hole evaporation which goes as like m cubed over h bar over one half. So there's an h bar, and it's really long. Um, and you can't do that. So, so this really is, you know, even if it were right, the conformal diagram for a Planck mass black hole, which evaporates on the same time scale as its dynamical time. And if it's a Planck mass black hole, you, have, Planck mass black hole, you don't have any business drawing a space-time diagram for it, for sure. Right, that's just pure quantum gravity. So if we really want to talk about an evaporating black hole, um, we, have to, uh, we have to let the, the incoming null shell, so here's some steps on the way. So let's tell another story. This is where the incoming null shell formed the black hole. Then we wait a really long time. And then we put t equals 0 kind of in the middle of this diagram. So this is now t equals 0 in the Schwarzschild space. Um, and then near t equals zero, this incoming shell comes and deletes the black hole, just as before. So this is the same, very same diagram, but instead, uh, instead of just a time m in between these two, there's now a long time in between the formation and destruction. And we've put the destruction at like t equals zero, so the formation is way back here, and it's all been squished down. Uh, so if you follow, if you take the previous curve, this was the incoming shell, and you send all of these back to much earlier time, they basically kind of shift down. So I'm sending those to much earlier time in the background in Kasky space. So this thing follows down, this one follows down, and I end up with this diagram where this is the incoming shell. The initial Minkowski space is basically all buried down here in the corner. So this is what it looks like when a black hole has been sitting around for a really long time. Um, and I think I first learned about this from Andrew Hamilton, who's been, who's been talking about it for a long time and getting really mad because people don't listen to him. And I think he's, he's just right about this. 
uh, that if you have something that forms a black hole like a star or something, the, the star ends up being, after a long time, the description looks like this, the star is plastered here, and if you're outside the black hole sitting around and looking at the black hole, what you're seeing is not this horizon here. You're seeing this one. You're seeing this super red-shifted surface of the thing that formed the black hole squinched onto here. And he has nice animations where he shows uh, basically this. And once you cross the horizon, you suddenly see two horizons, this one and this one. Uh, but until you cross the event horizon, you, what you're really looking at when you're looking at a black hole is this surface here, which I think he calls the illusory horizon. So I've become convinced by, by both him and just looking at these things myself um, that this is the better way to look, much better way to look at an old black hole that formed a long time ago. And here I have it that formed a long time ago and then it gets deleted. I, I'm not sure I'm understanding this. Um, mm -hmm. If you're outside the black hole uh, in, and you're remaining stationary outside of the black hole, your tricord takes an infinite amount of time. So certainly it's yeah. true that if you're looking at it, you're never seeing the horizon because the horizon has formed yet, so just seeing um, very highly red-shifted stuff yeah. from just before the horizon. Are you saying right. something more than that? No, that's all. So, so that stuff is that stuff is here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, there's nothing, nothing more than that. that. Well, I'm not sure because people talk about being outside a black hole and looking at the horizon and point to this. Oh, that's and true. that's yeah. not the right thing to point okay. to. Okay, right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think there's anything. Uh, well, I'm, see, people seem to be disagreeing with Andrew when he was saying this too, and I'm not sure why. So uh, now, if I if I formed the black hole a long time ago and I'm here, and then a long time from now uh, the black hole gets deleted, then it's sort of the same thing. This line will shift up here, and I end up with a conformal diagram that looks like this, where um, the Minkowski, the initial Minkowski space is buried down here. The final one is buried up here, and the quantum gravity regime is all over here. So this is, if you're going to talk about a black hole that's kind of evaporating <coughs> now, I think your diagram looks more like this than anything else, which is very different from the way people want to draw it, but uh, seems to be the case. And, and now we should. But this is not an evaporating black hole yet. This is a black hole that was formed and then just erased by this incoming uh, negative energy radiation. So now let's, um, you know, when I, when I teach undergraduate general relativity, I, we get to the section of Hawking radiation. I tell them, you know, you can think of it like little pair production of particles and one goes in and one goes out. And I've never felt totally sure that that's a good thing to do, but now I'm going to do it. Um, and, and, but rather than assuming it for particles, um, I'm going to let the particles be uh, ingoing and outgoing sheets of null dust or radiation or whatever. So this is a, so this is a full shell that's outgoing and ingoing. And so rather than sending in um, so I'm going to start out by forming the black hole a long time ago, just as in the last one. Now I'm going to assume here that due to some quantum process, I nucleate an uh, incoming shell of radiation and an outgoing shell of radiation, which locally, right near the horizon, had a sum zero energy. So, so I just had to use quantum mechanics to kind of uh, break the laws of physics a little bit to start those going, but, but I don't violate energy conservation. Then this one goes in, this one goes out. All this one does then is change the mass of the Schwarzschild black hole in here. So the mass goes down a little bit in this region. Outside, it's still the same as it was before because I've taken away the mass here, but then I've kind of added it back here. So this part out here is unaffected. Causally, it has to be anyway. Uh, and here, the Schwarzschild black hole's mass has gone down. And then I let the, sheet, the shell come in from infinity and delete everything. So what I've done is kind of mock up one little step of a black hole evaporation. And what happens is the, the, the mass goes down, which brings both the Schwarzschild horizon 
in a little bit, so it now matches onto one of the smaller radius uh, surfaces of the previous black hole, and it brings in a quantum gravity regime in a little bit as well. If you calculate what that means. So you're deleting the black hole just to get the time scales. Yeah, so, so I'm going to not delete it next, but okay. this was just to, yeah, just to finish the diagram. Okay. <laughs> um, so then I'm envisioning black hole evaporation as a, as a long succession, kind of a, a continuum limit of this, where we give off infinitesimal shells um, and at each time decrease the mass of the black hole a little bit. So that, I didn't, wasn't able to draw like this, but I did a more figurative drawing that looks like this. Um, you can calculate for, you can calculate in this case that um, this, so, so if you kind of smooth over, over the horizon here, so you, you sort of take the, the Schwarzschild's horizon at each moment and then you just kind of draw a line through all of them, um, that's kind of obviously a time-like surface because these are null surfaces and it's kind of more bent up than that. If you look at this one, though, you can ask whether that's space-like or time-like. If you can do the computation, it turns out this is space-like um, until you get to a mass of, of order, the Planck mass, um, and then it goes time-like, though you know, it's not clear that you can really trust all the assumptions that went into it at that point. But it looks like this, this curve basically is space-like and then turns sort of time-like at the end. So like that, the horizon is sort of time-like always, like this. I'm making this red, red curve here. And so this is what, in this picture, would look like sort of at the end of black hole, the end stages of black hole evaporation. This would switch space like to time like. The black hole would kind of go away in a smooth way, um, and then you have the casket space up here. Now the crucial difference between, well, there are many differences, but a, cr a crucial difference is that this r equals zero, um, the part that's in the De Sitter quantum regime, um, never goes space-like. So r equals zero, everywhere on this thing is always time-like. It looks kind of null here, but it's actually just marginally time-like. So you don't get the sort of problem where when you draw surfaces across here, you get the information loss problem that you did before. Um, and this is just uh, the same diagram again, but with evaporation. So the claim is that if I want to talk about a, an evaporating black hole sort of in the middle of its tenure, this is sort of the sort of diagram I would have. Um, for, sort of for, this, for all the part of this diagram I can see, basically nothing happens, because um, all the evaporation takes a, a hugely long time. So there's a long time before you know, the time I'm looking at that's down here. There's a long time after that's up here. And then this this should have been purple here, but this, this boundary between the quantum and non-quantum regime now looks space-like here, and then this is representing where it goes time-like way at the very end, and kind of bends up there. So all that stuff gets buried in this corner and up on this edge. So that, so, so I think the, the bottom line in that sense is that there isn't a conformal diagram for an evaporating black hole. There's like several that you have to draw in order to really capture it um, because of these widely different time scales that are, that are inevitably involved in it. Um, and if you want to, under the assumptions that I've made, you know, the, the region kind of behind the quantum screen um, is better thought of as, as this kind of thing rather than, uh, you know, something that just cuts off like a singularity that's horizontal. So now, an interesting thing, and I'm still trying to work out the details of this, is can we now kind of combine this with the, the closed system sort of discussion that I was having before? Um, so, so by the way, before, so so far, am I already supposed to feel I have new insights about information? I don't think so, no. It's, it's just trying to yeah. do the, so it's the standard lore, but expressed correctly in, in space time. I think so, yeah. So this is the, if there's any more new insights to be had, it's probably in this section, which I haven't really totally worked out. <laughs> but um, so 
let's, let's tell the following story. Let's start with Minkowski space, and let's put, as I did for the Minkowski hole before, let's put a surface that go, that, let's remove the origin. So we have a closed system that is outside of this Cauchy horizon here. Okay. But I'm going to trickily set it up just so, such that the Cauchy horizon lines up with the Schwarzschild horizon right when this null shell of incoming radiation crosses and forms a black hole. So the black hole basically forms right here, crosses the, the Schwarzschild horizon, uh, the Schwarzschild radius right here. And that coincides with this Cauchy horizon uh, of my closed system. So now, if I, if I think about the normal black hole picture where I have a, the, the Schwarzschild horizon and say a stretched Schwarzschild horizon that's like a plank length away, um, it turns out that my Cauchy horizon, my closed system Cauchy horizon, will stay in between the Schwarzschild horizon and the stretched horizon for a long time. Uh, that is, if I, uh, so why would it leave? It would leave because the black hole evaporates <coughs> and gets smaller, the Schwarzschild radius moves in. But that takes a long time. And so for a long time, uh, if I'm out here, there's no real distinction between the Schwarzschild horizon and the, the closed system horizon that I've defined before. There's sort of, um, all that's happened relative to the Minkowski hole that I have before is that there's a period of time over which the horizon, while still staying null, gets stuck at a particular radius. Right, the, the Schwarzschild radius. Um, but, it, but the whole construction is, is basically exactly the same. Then eventually, the black hole evaporates enough that the black hole horizon kind of peels away from the Cauchy horizon. So now the, the black hole is now kind of gone, the Cauchy horizon keeps going out, and that approaches then, uh, you know, the, the the Minkowski hole at light time, which, which is the same thing basically as Rindley space. So it, it looks like I have effectively all of the, the, the shell of radiation that passed through did was take my, my expanding Cauchy horizon, um, delay it for a little while, stall it for, for some time, where it had a fixed radius for a while, and then let it go again, and it kept continuing out. And so in this story, there's kind of a long time in which the, the closed system, the Minkowski hole, looks like a black hole. I mean, it is a black hole, but, but it, um, I can think of it now just as being the, the Minkowski hole, but with some slightly funny metric so that it gets stalled for a while. But there's no necessarily true event horizon. There's nothing that endures forever. It's just a momentary delay. In its evolution. But if I continue to that diagram that I had before, what this closed system looks like, it doesn't cover um, what happens after the black hole evaporates. All that stuff is outside of the system. It doesn't really cover anything after the peeling away part, where the, where the black hole horizon, the Schwarzschild horizon, sort of peels away from the Cauchy horizon. Um, no, nothing and no information in the closed system ever enters the black hole. You know, it all just stays out here. And it never touches the quantum gravity region. If you're in this closed system, you definitely see radiation coming from the black hole, because there was this long time um, here during which you had, you had this horizon, you had, it was static, your, your spatial surfaces were, uh, were the natural ones that <coughs> looked just like the spatial surfaces in the Schwarzschild metric. So it looked like the black hole. You could do the same sorts of calculations and see radiation. Later, you, look, you feel like you're in Rindler space because you have to be accelerating away to stay in this closed system. Right? If you want to stay in this thing, you better accelerate away. You look like you're in Rindler space. At the beginning, you were briefly in something that looked kind of like Rindler space. Um, so you see sort of radiation of different types the whole time. You might attribute entropy to this thing the whole time. But nothing ever really went into the black hole. Uh, and information is explicitly preserved by construction because you've always stayed in this closed system. So the, you had this shell form the hole, mm -hmm. and you defined your, clo your 
closed system, just the other side of that formation? Yeah, just... Um, uh, so there's sort of a, a, a difference of scale. So you've taken... So if I think of the black hole formation as maybe more of a continuous process, it'll muddy this somehow. Yeah, but I don't think change it in, in essence. I mean, it, it, if it so took a while... So you just want to steer clear of the process of formation. So, so is the key point that the, you expect the black hole to take a lot longer to decay than to form? Well, that's certainly true. I mean, it's almost impossible to form yeah. one that slowly. But and and then that gives you a time scale to kind of play with. I think it. I don't think it would look that different if I formed it more gradually. I, I, I might have to aim my my Cauchy horizon a little more carefully yeah. so that it lined up. It's you just want it to stay out. I just want to stay, stay. I wanted to stay just outside because I want to illustrate that this horizon and the black hole horizon are basically the same thing. I mean, I can't see any Huge real. Of time. Yeah, and 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 in, I can't see any real distinction between those two horizons and how they behave or anything like that. Um, now, there's another story, which says, well, let's let's suppose that we knew quantum gravity, um, and that we could actually do calculations that took us through this quantum regime of the black hole. Um, then we could imagine a description that looked like this, where we start with a, a space-like slice that goes all the way across. It just evolves through the quantum regime, and then it ends up at the evaporated stage way up here. Um, and in this case, we would have no information loss either, by sort of by assumption. We don't know how to do this calculation. Um, now, it's not clear how, in what sense, we would have thermal radiation and things either. I'm not sure how that description would look. We sort of have to have it because the black hole has to go away. But it's a, it's a tricky thing to, to think exactly how that's going to look. So this is, the, the big, this is a question mark diagram. Um, but in my mind, the, the interesting thing, to me an interesting thing is that you, um, the idea that there's something fundamentally different about a black hole event horizon versus a Rindler horizon or, or just some general Cauchy horizon, I can't really make sense of uh, at this point. I mean, I never really could, but, but I have even more trouble making any sense of that now. And so if I haven't thought about firewalls, you know, I have, well, I've thought about them. I haven't talked about firewalls in this talk at all, but they, certainly they rely on there being some fundamental distinction between a black hole event horizon and, say, a Rindler horizon, since it's a Rindler horizon everywhere. Right? Uh, and I just can't swallow that. So, as I said, there's a lot of vague things and, and unsolved issues, but I think the, the takeaways, I would say, are that first, genuinely closed systems smaller than the entire universe exist, at least at the classical GR level, and I think should provide a self-consistent description of physics. The same physical system, though, might be described and with different description using, using different closed systems, and it's important to be aware of when you changed which description you're using, because I think a lot of confusion comes from implicitly using two at once. I think the space-time diagram of an evaporating black hole is highly misleading, uh, and a better set exists that is cumbersome and is less misleading. I think it's an interesting hypothesis to explore that the Cauchy horizon and the stretched version of it is really the entity to which entropy should be ascribed, not so much an, an event horizon or an apparent horizon. Uh, and it, it's an in, another interesting hypothesis that the, the thermodynamic entropy we ascribe to now Cauchy horizons is essentially the entanglement entropy between the horizon uh, region and the interior or exterior, depending on what sort of closest to the time. Um, so some things that I would like to do that are open, I'd like to do some actual entropy calculations um, of the, the small closed systems and see things work out in, in toy examples uh, better than and, and I think that would be nice to see if and how it works out. Thinking about the sitter space and other space times, I've been talking to Andy a lot about that today, um, and what do you think of the sitter entropy and, and so on. Um, and similar with the no hair theorem and fluctuations in the sitter space and the black hole. And I feel like once I have a handle on what I really think, um, then I'll decide what I think about firewalls and why they can't possibly exist.
<laughs> Thanks very much. Questions? Steve. So, in the last picture where you say, let's say that we can evolve through the uh, quantum region, um, I'm a little confused about time scales because I haven't thought about this. For an observer who remains outside of the black hole, how long does that quantum region last? Is that a very long time or is it a short time? How long does the quantum region last? I think it, um, see it's tricky because I'm not sure how to describe that. So, so the observer that you're talking about has to, um, On the side. They're, they're, they're going to go out here yeah. and then kind of sit up here and sneak back along there. Right. Um, so, so actually, you know, Shinji Mokuyama and I looked at space times exactly like this. And what you put your finger on exactly what the problem is. Because when you try to glue them together, you have the problem with the fact that the future horizon on the in, as seen on the inside is enormous, right? Because you have this, uh, you know, the, the, an observer that's heading into the future horizon inside the black hole. You're trying to make some global picture that fits together, right? And that, that is inflating or whatever. It's expanding. It's becoming enormous, right? On the other hand, the outside observer, if you want the conventional picture, has got to see the last stages of evaporation happen very quickly. And so the projection of that onto the future null infinity has to be small. And we didn't really prove a no-go theorem, but it seems very hard to write down any space-time that has that property. Well, right. So what I'm wondering about is whether uh, what really happens is that that quantum region is very long. Very long so that, that would work, but the thing that, is that then you... That's a remnant. That's a remnant. And that's, exactly. that's what and that's happens perfectly. if you look at right. some exact models of dilaton gravity, right. where you actually can trace through the quantum region. And you get something that looks sort of yes. like that, but with a very, very long lived remnant mm -hmm. uh, that, that has all sorts of correlations with the not quite thermal radiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be. I haven't thought about that question. Yeah, I think remnants are perfectly fine. They just they just don't jive with ADS-CFT. Yeah. So yeah. But I, I just wondered what the metric is. Yeah, that may be. I'll think about that, but I, I, I have to think about it. Um, yeah. hmm. So I have a question for Steve. So are you, or I guess, I guess for Marcus, because I teach in a half an hour and I'm not yeah. prepared, so okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, at my, I'm at my unitary limits. I'll ask you, what were you going to say in your class? <laughs> no. So I, I guess I missed the point you were making, Steve. So, um, there this are... Could, there could be a remnant? Yeah, that, that region labeled Q up there. The question is what that looks like from the outside. I mean, that's sort of this inside of the, the black hole down to the point that you're near enough to the singularity that you have uh, quantum, the curvature scale has gotten large, you have quantum gravitational effects yeah. taking over. If from the outside, for a, an observer, say, who is just at rest and watching the black hole form and evaporate, if that lasts for an extremely long time, then it's what people call a remnant. And there are some specific models with remnants in two-dimensional dilaton gravity in which you can take care of the firewall problem and all that, and everything works, uh, and it, everything is nicely unitary, as long as you have a remnant that lasts for a very long time and that has strong correlations with the pumping radiation that was emitted earlier. So what's very long, just much longer than the time time? Or, or? I don't know. Uh, I 
you can work out, I don't remember this, but there's some old calculation, uh, probably going back to page, that uh, tells you um, if you have a very low mass remnant, how fast information can be transferred out of it uh, enough, how, how fast enough information can be transferred out of it to make the whole formation and evaporation process unitary. But I don't remember what the answer is. So why, why would you, so, so the, I guess the puzzling, the thing that caught me the first time around was that this seems so model independent. And now you're talking about a specific, you know, specific deleton, a specific type well, of gravity. Well, I mean, this isn't really modeling. I guess it isn't. Okay, that's the point. There are assumptions. You've made certain assumptions the, about how it. Where the quantum gravity regime forms and how you model the evaporation. Okay. And, um, okay. So all I'm saying is that there is one specific model that I know that has a Penrose diagram that looks sort of like this and that's understood well enough that it's known to, to be unitary. Okay. And so maybe that's a generic feature here. I mean, a big part of this is understanding how various time snapshots. Yeah. And so maybe there's an argument here that generically the time that you get in, for this quantum region. That makes, so, so I think they, the, so the question we've worked out is when this goes time-like, and I think that's essentially the, the regime you're talking about. Right? Once I think this, so. Once this turns time-like, and we figured out the mass, and that happens at a tiny mass, but I, we haven't tried to figure out a, a time scale associated with that. So that, uh, you know, modulo the fact that all of this can't be classical space-time. Right. Right? Um, we could probably try to work out that time scale. But we have no yeah, idea. I mean, if you're looking at it from the outside, from where there's a good semi-classical description, and you look at right. the time scale there, it may be that that time scale is long enough to allow for these limits on the rate of information mm -hmm. transfer to make the thing unitary. That would be interesting. Okay, that, that's very helpful. I, I definitely agree. Or it may have nothing. <laughs> well, those limits should apply, though. So, so if there's a picture to be assembled, it should make sense. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting perspective. Any, Any other questions? Okay, well, we'll these around um, the rest of the day. We can, those of you who want to come to dinner, we're, we're going to have a, on the early side, we're going to go to the courtroom, but, um, He's going to drive back tonight, but um, just get